All right, so we are jumping in to Mark chapter 7. Uh, don't quite know how much we are going to get through of this chapter. Uh, quite honestly, it's probably one of the more difficult chapters in uh, the Gospels, uh, definitely in Mark. And it's we're going to have to slow down and kind of try to figure out what's going on here. There's a, a couple of very difficult teachings. Uh, one, a very difficult exchange that, uh, unless we're in cultural context, uh, really can uh, portray Jesus in a negative view, quite honestly. Uh, so maybe we'll get to that. That's at the end of the chapter. But just a couple things as we dig into this. Uh, Ancient Near Eastern culture, under, cultural understanding is really key to this passage, uh, and especially uh, with regards to Jewish law, Jewish commandments, Jewish traditions. And so there's things that are going to be talked about here that uh, on face value, uh, we won't quite understand uh, coming from the West. Uh, and so we will, really will rely on the Holy Spirit to uh, help us wade through uh, the conversations Jesus is going to have with the Pharisees, the crowd, and then his disciples in this. And as we do that, uh, we also then must wrestle with what is the application for us uh, in our world, in our time frame, in our Gentile circumstance. Because like some other interchanges with uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the uh, religious leaders, uh, it is regards to Jewish custom, Jewish law, uh, Old Testament commandments. And so uh, what does that mean for us? What did that mean for Mark's readers, uh, especially as they uh, wrestled with this particular set of teachings and passage? So with that being said, let's just jump into verse, verses one through four here. So uh, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus. So Jesus is still in his ministry uh, up around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so they've taken uh, some time to go check out uh, what this uh, crazy rabbi up north is up to. And so they've made that journey. And so they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So, uh, not much, uh, you know, anything too far off going on there, but it is curious. Why do you think Mark uh, gives us this parenthetical phrase after the comment about uh, the disciples having hands that are defiled or unwashed? I think probably it has to do with the, with the context of the letter and who it's primarily addressed to. I yeah. don't think that the, the Roman Gentile mind would understand maybe the traditions and whatnot. So Paul or Mark has taken a moment to kind of back it up and, and, and give them some context. Good. Other thoughts on that? Was this a practice of all the Jewish... Uh, or just the religious uh, segment there are the upper echelon Pharisees and things like that. How about the common folk? Well, Mark adds this, and if you look at some of the uh, Jewish writings with regards to the law, they often include the phrase, all the Jews, the Pharisees and all the Jews. Um, although uh, history would tell us that, uh, as you were saying, Don, the lower echelons, probably didn't hold to this as much. Um, they were just trying to live their lives. And uh, it was the Pharisees, teachers of the law specifically, who really tried to hold to this tradition more so. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come across that they had any um, hygienic understandings 
is more of a religious thing. Uh, this particular thing is a religious thing, right? Uh, but for us, we definitely see the hygienic <laughs> aspect of it. And really, if you look at uh, the Levitical laws that have to do with purity, and you step back from them, yes, God was trying to set up Israel as a different type of community. Uh, but when you look at them, it really was, you know, you really shouldn't touch that particular thing. You should try to be clean. And he wanted to see uh, the Israelites live longer. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So their witness, you know, could live longer. And so it did have both. And I think what we're going to wrestle with here is, um, did the Pharisees take it too far? The teachers of the law take it too far? And I think that's where Jesus is going to go in this conversation. And so... Uh, you know, just curious with regards to these laws, um, because this is going to be a bit of a debate, and it is something that they brought up, are purity laws bad in and of themselves? I mean, one of the more famous ones, it isn't necessarily a law, but every restaurant you go to, employees must wash your hands before leaving the restroom, uh, even before uh, the pandemic uh, settled in, uh, we were trying to do that. So, um with regards to purity laws, just thoughts on that, because it really does take up a lot of uh, the Torah, the laws in the Torah. It's a very important thing. All right, so we're gonna have a tough crowd today. Um, everybody go get your coffee. Let's make my job easier, please. So we'll, we'll go on to the next, we'll go to verse five. Can you hear me? Uh, who is this? Philip. Uh, now I can, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've been having uh, issues with this uh, software. Um, let's be mindful that in Judaism and the Levitical, uh, regulations, um, what the Pharisees at this point in their history were doing was the enforcement of the Talmud, which went way beyond. And of course, Jesus said, in vain do you worship me, teaching the doctrines and precepts of men. Uh, codified regulations specified even their dishes. Uh, one set of dishes or cooking instruments uh, were specific for fish. Another set of dishes were specific for meats. Um, what were these vessels? Oh, a lot of them could have been clay pots or what have you. Mm -hmm. And the consequence is that you've got residue inside there and you're going to have issues with bacteria. And uh, I appreciated your comment with regard to God looking after and extending longevity to the Israelites. But in this day and age, the, the disciples, um, the, the, the regulations, it, it, I, don't, I don't think this issue of the food was only the specific, I think it was a collection of many issues that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Talmudic regulations that were being stuffed down people's throat. And Jesus is just going right to the heart of the problem. Because if the Jews were in fact Torah observant, I doubt highly that he'd even be making comment on this. Thanks, Philip. I really ap appreciate that. That's uh, largely where I wanted to go, and I thank you for pointing out the Talmud, because that's what we're going to deal with here is scripture versus tradition, um, and where the elders have taken that. So thank you very much. Other thoughts, uh, now that <clears throat> Phillips provided some more background? I, I think, you know, maybe a, a, a modern day uh, parallel to that, what Philip shared would be like in the state of Montana, the legislature passes laws, but then the, the, uh, the different departments of the state of Montana uh, take those laws and they, they end up writing what they call the ARMs or the, the, the administrative rules of Montana. And out of those laws and these rules are, are, are interpreted as to how how law is to be enforced and how, how the law is to be implemented throughout these different departments. And so the administrative rules are much like the Talmud. They're, they're very extensive as compared to the law and keeping up with the administrative rules is a, is a real chore. Oh, 
Thanks, Randy. That's great. More modern context for us. That answer is part of my question, Scott, but I was going to ask if you could just give a sentence or two about the historic context of what the Talmud versus the Torah is. Well, I, I don't I read think, it very often. <laughs> do you even have a copy, dear? I know <laughs> we don't have one at home. <laughs> but it is, that's, uh, you know, as Philip and R Randy alluded to, uh, so it's the continued interpretation uh, and even rules of enforcement uh, beyond what we see in scripture. And there is, was actually a segment of uh, Jewish leadership that that's all they spent their time doing um, was looking at that. I mean, it's just like the Sabbath laws are, you know, some of those that are a really good example. Uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then you have a few other Levitical laws, but then if you go to the Talmud and other rabbinical writings, uh, you end up with 600 other uh, ways to interpret that, like Randy was mentioning. Is, well, this, is this, one of the first five books of the Bible, or is that? I, what's that? Is the Torah, the first five books of, of the Bible? Yes. Uh, yes, but and also the specifically Torah law as well. The so the uh, oh, you were going to interject yeah the 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 issue of the the talmud effectively the talmud itself as i understand it is likened unto a commentary and the and the commentary was produced by all of the jewish rabbis and sages and then of course you'll find that there's a plethora of disagreement among rabbis but yet they are upholding the Talmud with even greater authority. This created a, a real barrier for the gospel because the Torah was, be, I mean, the Talmud was being so strictly adhered to. And Jesus said, I did not come to destroy uh, the, the, the law, the Torah. I did not come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it and or to complete it. Adam created Adam created the mess the world has been in for these last several thousand years. Jesus is the only one who fulfilled to perfection the requirements of the Torah. We don't have to. It's been done for us. Amen. And the Jews with, re with regard to the, the Talmud looked at the Talmud as almost absolute supreme law. And for instance, you've got the man that is standing in the temple or nearby and, and, and he's saying, I thank God uh, that I'm not like that poor publican over there who is over there beating his chest saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, that is the, the diametric con, uh, contrast between a Talmud observer and a Torah observant. Nicodemus, if he came to see Jesus at night, uh, was very much Torah observant. Why? Because if you're uh, holding and adhering to the Torah, you will have recognized uh, that Jesus was who he claimed to be and who the prophets said was going to be and it, it was the Talmud that got in their way. And, um, you know, they talk about him being crucified by lawless men. Well, they were being, he was being crucified by Torahless men. Lawless men included the Romans because they were the agents of execution. But lawless, yeah, absolutely. And of course, the Talmud is not the Torah. It's a commentary. W why would we, in our devotions and study of God spend our entire waking times reading commentaries as opposed to the word of God itself. That's yeah, why good, I have issue with this plethora, this plethora of different translations that are coming out that are not specifically thus saith the Lord because the words of God are not being allowed by the Holy Spirit to actually work within us because of the opinions of men. 
Good. Well, that's good setup for where we're going here. Thanks, Philip. So verse five. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition, which we've just been talking about quite a bit, of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And so, you know, obviously we're how concerned really were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? Uh, maybe there is some who, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, as... We're ready, I think, start with Rita. Is it all right if we start with you so that you can just focus on the... Uh, John, could you... The, um, oh, you're not taping this meeting. Is there a fruit or there is... Let's, let's do... Thank you. Um, so, uh, were they really concerned? I think... Um, you know, maybe there are still some, Nicodemus would be a prime example, who were really interested in what Jesus had to say. They were curious, uh, was he really the fulfillment of the prophecies? Uh, but more than likely, this is just one of their attempts to um, kind of make him look bad in front of the crowds. Uh, because as we know, since, uh, you know, we just had the discussion a couple of weeks ago of the feeding of the 5,000 or the 15,000 and the crowds that continue to follow him, uh, he is really gaining in notoriety and a following. Um, verse six, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. And so Jesus is kind of seen through some of what they have to say. Uh, and his comment to them is, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And we, as Philip brought up, and we've had a little discussion of that, traditions uh, versus what was uh, the, thus saith the Lord, word of God. Uh, and so uh, just an interesting question to go through. Uh, what is more important, scripture or tradition? Uh, back then, uh, for them, um, we're seeing what the answer is, because Jesus does tell them that they've put more into human traditions. But, uh, you know, for us today, uh, and uh, with regards to, um, you know, church in the United States, what do we tend to focus on more? Where are we at? What should we be focused on more? And this is a loaded question. Um, and so let's just see where we go from here. <laughs> Jerry, uh, good laugh. Thank you. <laughs> I think probably the, the thing I, I would look to in, in trying to answer this question is the idea or it is, Am I, am I a Christian or do I identify myself with the denomination? And in doing so, what happens is, is that when we start focusing on denominationalism rather than, than, than Christianity, we end up then, I think, absorbing more of the traditions than we do the scripture. And so I think there's a danger in it. And I think, you know, oftentimes we, uh, we, wear, the, we wear the badge of denomination proudly. Uh, uh, and we end up at times, I think, sacrificing what it is to be Christian when we do so. And so I, I, I guess that would, the thing I would say is that it's more important to, to focus on Scripture and, and to live out a Christian life out of that, uh, understanding that even within a denomination, two of us can get together and we're going to find differences about how we, how we view things and whatnot. But overall, we still uh, recognize the fact that we have to be subordinate to what scripture tells us, uh, more so than tradition. Hmm. Thanks, Randy. That's a good, That's good. good start. So when I you. was first starting out with the church, uh, I, uh, let's say a Billy Graham had something, you know, to say about a scripture. And, well, the tradition of the church, I guess, was, well, you better be careful about what you, what, you know, how you take what Billy says, because, you know, he's a, I don't even know what Billy was, a Baptist, maybe, I, I don't know. Um, but the point is, he's not in the Church of Christ, so you got to take what he's saying with a grain of salt, and you be very careful there, um, rather than enjoying what uh, he might be saying about Scripture, and, you know, 
Billy Graham said a lot of great things about, you know, what God was wanting um, and what Jesus was wanting from the scripture. Thanks, Scott. You, um, some of you, I think, maybe heard me say this before, but uh, a couple of us here have uh, studied Greek over at Carroll College. They had a uh, the head of the language department there who was a scholar in classical languages and classical Greek. And because most Carroll College students didn't care to take that, we had private tutoring. So sitting in his office uh, one day, and uh, I asked, asked him, he's quite elderly at the time. I asked him, I says, well, you're, you're a classical Greek professor. You know this language inside out. Um, how is it that you can look at the word baptism and uh, it's not translated uh, directly and you accept, uh, you know, the, the way that the Catholic Church uh, does this? And he just looked kindly and straight at me and said, Don, it's just a matter of tradition. The, uh, the reason that I accept the way the, that the church teaches is it. I, you know, I know it's immersion, but it's tradition in the church, and we accept that. Well, this all comes down to issues of authority. Um, hey, I'm on here. Oh, sorry. God has given entrustments to mankind. What are those entrustments? Well, if we go back to the Torah, there is what is recited in every synagogue around the world is recited what is known as the Shema. The word Shema means to hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. In Hebrew, it's Adonai Echad. Echad means one. God is a composite unity. He's made up of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The three are one, as we understand that. Now, if this begins invoked as a tradition, then a, a, a traditions can be right, and then they can also be wrong. But Jesus, as the Torah says, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul. So God has entrusted mankind with the keeping of the heart, the keeping of the mind, and the keeping of the soul. So therefore, the word has absolute authority, not tradition. These things are entrustments. And then Jesus came along, and he gave entrustments to the world to make it plain and clear. And the scripture itself speaks volumes about these entrustments. So it comes down to the individual, as the Bible says, a man stands or falls, okay, before his creator. The sins of one are not passed upon the other. The sins are the responsibility of the individual. So sin is something that is accountable, but we are also accountable for the entrustments. What God has given us, God entrusted the oracles of God to the Jews. What did they do with that? There is, a, there is a word in Hebrew, which is tikon olam, which means to repair the world. Were they doing that? Are they doing that today? And then the church enters into the pages of history, and, and, and the church spread like fire around the world. Because the church recognized the entrustments of God and entrustments are far more powerful 
than traditions. But, you know, even with that, I think we have to be, keep in mind that um, uh, our scripture that we have today came, through us, came to us through a, prophet, or, or a process of, of human interaction and involvement, uh, humans making judgment on what was, what they referred to as canon and what wasn't. And so we end up then with, with scripture, again, that's interpreted by man or, or taken by man and, and, and condensed into what we call our Bible today uh, through a process that was, uh, we, we hope, spirit-driven. Uh, we trust that it is, but it's still a case where, where men were involved in, in, in how we came about with, with this Bible that we have. And so when we look at scripture, we have to understand that that man was involved with it, just like man is involved in, in everything that God, that God puts in place for us. And by establishing our scripture, we also establish out of that scripture what our traditions look like based on what scriptures tell us. And so it's a, it's a complex thing. It's just, it's just not a simple black and white question where you can look to and say, oh, it's all scripture or it's all tradition. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nuanced blending of, of, of it with man involved in every step of the way. Does, does tradition trump the Torah? I don't think it's a matter so much of one or the other. It's a matter that they, God's way of bringing it about to us uh, intended a mixture. Um, and we want to make that mixture um, as um, we want to do that very responsibly responsibly and, and correctly, but it is going to be a mix. Um, that's just the way God chose to do it. And so I'd rather not focus too much on what, uh, what's better or at the exclusion of the other, but I guess as a default, I'll just go back to scripture and be willing to reject a tradition that's shown to me that it's not uh, consistent with scripture after all. The thing we have to look at, too, is, is I always come back to the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus spends the time preaching the Sermon on the Mount, what he does is he demonstrates in his character and his words what the proper interpretation and the tr proper, proper uh, effect of law is on a person's life. If Jesus fulfilled law, then what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount is telling us how to do that. And that his, char his character being perfect and whatnot shows us how that's done. So as a result, then we can look at the scripture and go, okay, I understand that this is what it says, but this is what Jesus says it's supposed to be done. And Jesus is perfect. And therefore I have to make the assumption that the law, though perfect, is not perfect until it's lived out correctly. And Jesus shows us the way to do that. Amen. I think there's another important question here too, besides the, the uh, contrasting scripture to tradition, but in verse six, you know, he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are, are far. <laughs> I think it's, you know, another question is what is more important? Where, where is our heart um, versus e tradition um, or, or even versus scripture? Because if our heart is not pierced by the commands of God, um, or by traditions, if our heart is hardened and we're just focused on whichever set of rules, that's where we go astray. If we take a look at the book of Proverbs, and I remember Randy, uh, when he took us through the wisdom uh, of literature in the Bible, Proverbs... <clears throat> Where did all of that information and all those sage given sayings come from? And yet those words have such powerful meaning and application and truth to this very day, but they were not, they did not originate just from one source. Did they Randy? What the the, uh, the the wisdom uh, uh, from the from in the proverbs themselves? Yeah, no, they're from multiple sources. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Every once in a while, I go back to the thought that I think from the first uh, first century uh, New, New Testament church till the 1600s, nobody, if we had 20 people in class, we didn't have 20 Bibles. And that all through the New Testament church time, so much had to be passed on verbally. Well, not totally true on that, Don. The, the, the early church had the Didache, which was a collection of all of the sayings and teachings of the apostles. And the, and the Didache was held in great reverence. The Didache didn't speak in opposition to scripture. It was what we would call extra biblical. It was, it was very valuable. So they were not without. <clears throat> I don't think everybody no, had Don, a copy. Today. I think Don's point was that if there's 20 people, there's not going to be 20 script, you know, Bibles in their hands. I think that's the point, right, Don? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> One's good enough. So you had to rely a lot on human, uh, ability and human accuracy and, and the Holy Spirit, of course, to, uh, to bring things through as accurately as possible. Which Judaism relied upon, which was through oral tradition. Mm -hmm. Oral tradition did much to help carry uh, the will and the word of God through the centuries, but uh, it went into an evolution process to become something more than what I think God intended. I, I think questions like this are full of irony, especially when they're held up against the scripture that we're looking at, because we could talk about and debate and argue a question like this all day long. And as soon as we thought that we got it, had it all figured out, it would be the very time that Jesus would say, you're a bunch of hypocrites because... <laughs> It, we cannot figure it all out. It's impossible. We can't get it all right. We never will. We never have. And um, thankfully, we've got the grace of him, of God, of Christ, to take us through that place because we can get it right. And um, I think this is interesting because the Pharisees are trying to nail him down on something like they always do and hold him up against the wall on something. And he slips out of that by by pointing out their their hip, hypocrisy and their um, always wanting to be, they're, they're trying to be God. And so the closer we think that we're getting to that, the farther away we're getting, I think. That's my opinion. Are you suggesting hypocrisy in this discussion, which is not an argument, but only a discussion? No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when I think that I've got, I'll speak for me I'm, uh, instead of third person. When I think that I've got it all figured out is the is when I'm the farthest away from God that I can be. I think that's exactly what Christ is saying to me in these verses. When when I think that I've got it all figured out, then I should probably step back and understand that I can't figure it all out and I need that grace to carry me home. Yeah, and my comment about the you know, the passage of time and limited numbers of, of print uh, went to the comment that was made about the canons, uh, certain people picking and choosing and trying to decide which are valid and inspired and, and which are not and which would go into our Bible and which would not go into our Bible. And, uh, and that's where I, uh, I have to feel like we have to, you know, rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance, hopefully, and all of that. We get in trouble Amen. when we speak for God, and I think that's what they were doing, and sometimes that's what we do. Jerry, you were saying, speaking that they think they know the mind of God? and Yes. Yeah. Which goes to Cody's point when we we know the mind of God entirely <laughs> well 
there's no way you can. And that's why, but that's why scripture is so important. So to personalize it like Cody did, I mean, maybe I need to ask myself in verse eight, where have I let go of the commands of God? And where instead am I holding on to traditions that I'm just comfortable with, but, and, and I'm judging other people that are not following traditions because that's what he's pointing out here, right? Mm -hmm. That they're from heart, their hearts are far from God because of, and, and that's manifesting itself in that judgment. Mm -hmm. We have to remember too, like, like Philip indicated earlier, that the, the Talmud um, provides arguments for, for scripture. Uh, and, and usually those are very short, but, but the arguments to get around scripture or work around scripture to, to, to meet man's end are quite extensive. And so as a result of that, what happens, I think, is that our traditions are much the same. They're, they're, a lot of them are built out of something that, that we want to have for ourselves that we're looking at selfishly. And so uh, we start modifying things uh, in order for us to satisfy what we think it should be. And so as a result of that, our traditions are based oftentimes out of things that are uh, human-centered or self-centered or, or, or satisfies the human need, uh, uh, oftentimes at the expense of what the intent of the original law might have been. And so uh, we look at traditions, you know, I, I preached not long ago about all the, the different denominations we have in Christianity, and, and all of them are built out of the fact that we wanted to be somewhat unique or different, or we had held a particular view, and I wasn't willing to look further than what my thought of that view might be <laughs> at this point. And as a result, then we end up with a split and, and another denomination and ad, ad nauseum. And so uh, I, I think there's danger in, in the fact that if we don't recognize that, that scripture uh, is always going to be interpreted through a human lens, and traditions and, and denominations are built out of those human lenses. Yeah. Verse nine. <clears throat> verse nine is a pretty good, I think, definition of rationalization. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own tradition. Sounds like rationalization in there to me. Uh, almost like making it an art form to do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and um, I wasn't going to talk much about 9 to 13 because once again, it, it, it's something that's kind of lost uh, to us. But what Jesus does is he pulls something out of their tradition uh, and kind of states how they've made that more important than, you know, a commandment, which you know, the Ten Commandments were held in very, very high honor as all of the law, but honor your father and mother, uh, but yet they had found a way where you could uh, at times get around that. And so he brings that up to point out their hypocrisy. Um, and as, you know, Don had said, you've got a, a way of setting aside those commands of God. And then moving on to, to 14, Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. So he's, he's had this setting where the disciples were there, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, these Jewish leaders and authorities show up, and they sit down at the table and have this conversation, and then he extends to the crowd. So he's, he's really trying to bring a lot of people into this conversation to help them understand, and I, I love how Cody continued to point out grace. And, you know, that's what he wants to show. And so listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. So that goes back to Annette's point with regards to the heart. You know, what, uh, you know, who you are truly internally uh, with the Holy Spirit, that will come out and people will see that. Uh, verse 17, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Uh, are you so dull, he asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their hearts, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. 
and I just put Peter in there in a parent, parenthetical statement inside of a parenthetical statement. Uh, Mark got a lot of his data from Peter. Uh, Peter, as we talked about in Acts, had the uh, incident with, uh, you know, the dream with God and then visiting Cornelius and that discussion. So I'm sure that had some influence there uh, into Mark's presentation of this. Uh, but the point is, Jesus is saying physical outside stuff as it enters the body is simply going to be processed through the body. Um, but it's how that impacts the heart and what the heart does with it. That's the important thing. And the heart in Jewish tradition was the, the seedbed, if you will, for everything. Um, all wisdom came through the heart. It was, um, you know, it really is the guts of uh, how we function. And so he's separating the two of them, kind of physical, spiritual, if you will. Um, and so that's where he's going with that with regards to defilement. Um, and so I, I found this interesting as I was thinking through this. So we've just gone through all of these incredible miracles. Um, you know, Mark has chosen, he, he hasn't included everything. You know, there's no way that you could do three years of ministry um, unless it was a, a, a long book. But he, Mark being inspired, has chosen the stories, the miracles, the teachings. So why does he go from all these incredible miracles to kind of what is, I'll say, a commercial interruption? You know, where, why do you think this is so important that he will stop um, that, I'll say, intense uh, ministry of Jesus to, to show us uh, this particular teaching? What's, what's for us in this? I think it's, it has to do with his audience again. I mean, this is to the Romans who don't understand all this food stuff and cleanliness stuff and um, things that are, are really confusing and uh, specific and uh, uninteresting, <laughs> uninteresting mm -hmm. to them. So I, I yeah. think Jesus is this, this text is, is going towards that, you know, talking about their heart and a lot of these details in these um, rules and traditions that really were man-made are, are not important. And so he's just, I think that is the interlude there to keep him focused on what is important, which is Jesus and his death on the cross and what he's about, not, not all these details that are irrelevant to, a, to the typical Roman of the day. Don't get sidetracked. Yep. I think it does one other thing, too, is that up to this point, Jesus has been physically performing these miracles, displaying his, his power as the son of God, as God in flesh. And now, you know, he does those demonstrations of power to get their attention. And now when he speaks on something like this, he has the power and authority to be able to make a declaration like this to say, do not do not mm -hmm. get caught up in the trappings that 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 that, that tradition leads into. But yeah. the heart is the critical thing, and the heart needs to be focused on on God. And mm -hmm. so, that's I, I think is part of it. He's he's using he's using the physical power of this to have authoritative power in in the mind of people that would would now understand it. Amen. Yeah, Randy, that that's great. I mean, think about the first six chapters are, you know, leaving no doubt to the reader who Jesus is. Um, by the level of miracles, the teaching and everything. And so it's kind of set him up to this opportunity where he can go to the heart of the matter. Um, yeah, good. Thanks, Randy. He takes away our excuse to blame anybody else for all the evil that comes out of our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's true, Don. It's uh, this group of sins that he groups up here all in one place uh that's just repeated over and over and over again throughout the entire new testament almost in the same words and uh yeah i think he's saying you just can't blame anybody else for what you allow to come out of your heart yeah yeah and uh 
thanks for reminding me of that, Don. We just have a couple minutes, but I do think it's important to look at that list that you referenced. So I just want to go through that really quickly. Uh, verse 20, he went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, to their being in Jewish thought, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile uh, the person. And so I, I think Mark is brilliant here um, because where the uh, teachers of the law wanted to stay were, you know, hey, how come they didn't wash their hands and stay at that level, but Jesus takes it to the next level and says, well, let's just throw all this stuff out there, sexual immorality, adultery, murder, et cetera, et cetera. That's, you know, the evils that come from the inside and defile an individual. Um, and so my question obviously was, why, why, do, why would we want to stay on the distracted piece? And thankfully, you know, Sean already alluded to that. Don't, don't be distracted and focus on um, really having Jesus come through uh, us and that's who we show and have Jesus come out of us with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. So that actually is our time. Um, one minute for any closing comments. We did not get to the, the last portion, so we'll save that for next week because once again, it's uh, Mark's brilliant writing leading us into the discussion with the, uh, the Gentile, the Syrophoenician woman. All right, well, uh, see some of you in a few minutes uh, and see the rest of you online. Have a blessed Sunday. Thank you, Scott.